Are you struggling to understand your GI map test results? A lot of people focus on the bacterial markers or the parasites, but I think that's not the most important part of the test. It's important, but you've got to take into account the intestinal health markers, because they can reveal crucial information about your digestive health, immune function, inflammation levels, and help to understand if the bacteria or parasites are really causing problems or not. So in this video, I'm going to explain each of the GI map intestinal health markers and what it means for your overall health. And whenever you're assessing results, you can't just focus on each marker one at a time. If you do that, you'll be treating many different things and taking often too many supplements. Sometimes it's best to treat one thing at a time or one system at a time to get the best results. And if you fix one thing, sometimes you don't have to focus on things, other things down the track. You also have to take into account each person's individual signs, symptoms, health history. Treatment may be different from one person to the next. So let's have a look at the GI map test result. We'll have a look at the overall result and then we'll focus on the intestinal health markers. So here you can see the GI map test. The first page looks at all the different, more serious pathogens. This is not the main problem. These are normally just acute symptoms, but for a lot of people with chronic problems, they're often negative in this section here. The next page looks at Helicobacter pylori, and if it's elevated, it doesn't always need to be treated. You would look at the intestinal health marker, elastase, inflammation markers, and other signs and symptoms like, does this person have reflux, nausea, those classic symptoms. In this situation, when it's high with positive virulence factors, you would always treat. The next section looks at the keystone bacteria like bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, acamansia, fecal bacterium. And if someone's got an overgrowth of bacteria but they're lacking the good ones, you may focus on this area. The next page looks at opportunistic or overgrowth bacteria. This is often the section where a lot of people have high levels and these bacteria can create a lot of inflammation. And you can see, you know, there's nothing high on this test, but you can see the intestinal health markers and that can help to explain how you need to treat these bacteria. Looking at candida, viral infections, more parasites, intestinal worms, and here we've got the intestinal health markers. So the first marker is steatocrit. And steatocrit's like your fat digestion analyzer. When you eat fats, they're broken down and your body absorbs them. But if you're not absorbing the fats, you'll get high levels of steatocrit in the stool. Ideally, it should be low as possible, but anything above, you know, seven or eight percent you're starting to get indicate fat malabsorption this can lead to low levels of things like vitamin d vitamin a vitamin e k and you can always confirm this by looking at these in the blood test or also looking at the next marker elastase seattle a specific fat digestion marker but elastase looks at how you digest lipase fats protease proteins and amylase which is carbohydrates on this test here, the elastase levels are excellent. When we look across at another test here, the elastase levels are very low. So this person here, they may need a supplement of digestive enzymes, but I would also look at things like Helicobacter pylori. Is that influencing the elastase levels? The next marker I'm gonna talk about is beta-glucuronidase. This is a detoxification marker, and it helps. Everyone thinks of detoxification as phase one and phase two of liver detoxification. But once the liver's process toxins, they're cleared out the, through the gut in the stool. And if you've got high levels of beta-glucuronidase, you can start to reabsorb those toxins back into your system. And when I say toxins, I don't always mean like environmental toxins, but this could be endotoxins produced by your gut bacteria, hormones like estrogen. And this could be one reason why people can be estrogen dominant. It's because they have elevated levels of beta-glucuronidase like here, and they're re not are able to eliminate and they're reabsorbing estrogen back into the system. The next mark we're going to look at is the occult blood FIT. People may not even notice a blood level that high. 173 is very high. And when you see levels like this, you've always got to look at things like kelp protector to see if it's elevated. In this case, the kelp protector is not that elevated. So I would always refer this person for further investigation. When we see a high level of blood in the stool like this, we always want to rule out colon cancer. And hopefully that is not the issue, it's just caused by like inflammation going on in the body. But we always, you know, we don't want to take a chance because colon cancer is one of the most treatable things when you catch it in this early stage. The next marker is secretory IgA. This is part of your gut's immune system or like it's your, your defense system against harmful bacteria. When you see high levels like this one here, 4,024, that's usually high when there's some type of bacterial infection or parasite or something like that. 
that. And, and that may explain, that in this person's situation, the high levels of blood. For some people, they'll have very low levels of secretory IgA, like this sample here. And often you'll see that in chronic infections or if people have been under a lot of stress, and when I say stress, if they're not sleeping well, long-term stress on the body will affect the body's immune system to be able to fight infections. The anti-gliadin IgA is a marker of gluten intolerance or gluten reactivity. It's not a marker of celiac disease. If levels are elevated, it doesn't mean you have to cut out gluten forever, but it usually means you should at least do a short-term 100% gluten-free diet. And there's more advanced tests out there like the Cyrex Array 3, the Vibrant Wellness Wheat Zoomer is one of my favorites that can do more advanced celiac testing. When you see this marker elevated, it means you should eliminate gluten. But for some people, they're reacting to gluten and this may not be high. But I will always go by how you're feeling. Gluten's also a high FODMAP. People could be reacting to gluten simply because it's a high FODMAP. And once you improve the bacterial overgrowth and heal the gut inflammation, they may be able to tolerate good quality gluten products again. The next marker is a zonophil activation protein. And this is a marker that can be elevated if there's parasites in the system, but also would be elevated if there's some type of food intolerance as well, or food, more of a food allergy rather than intolerance. The next marker is calprotectin. On this mark, on this test here, it's 116. Ideally, it should be less than 50. And this is a specific marker for inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. But this level of 116, especially if there's no blood present, it's probably not IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. It's probably caused by the inflammation caused by bacteria. So while the levels aren't that high, they're showing mild inflammation. If you did a colonoscopy looking at the gut mucosa, they probably wouldn't even detect this. This is very like low level inflammation, but still something to be addressed. The final marker is zonulin, and zonulin's a leaky gut marker. When you see elevated levels like this, that indicates at that moment there's leaky gut. Zonulin can tend to go up and down though. So just because you see a zonulin in a stool that's low, it doesn't 100% rule out leaky gut, but if it's high, it rules it in. One of the best tests for leaky gut is measuring the lipopolysaccharide levels in the blood. And also zonulin in the blood is probably a better marker as well. The lipopolysaccharides are produced by gut bacteria, and if they're in the blood, they're coming from the gut. That indicates there's some type of intestinal permeability going on. So this gives you an overall view of the intestinal health markers. And as I said, you always wanna take into account the, the bacteria, the parasites, the beneficial bacteria, plus the intestinal health markers. You don't wanna just treat one thing in isolation. And sometimes you need to treat the inflammation before trying to eliminate gut bacteria if there's a massive overgrowth. I always look at other markers too, like inflammation markers in blood, like ESR, CRP, even ferritin, which is an iron storage marker, will also be elevated if there's inflammation. I like to look at nutrients in the blood, like especially iron, zinc, B12, because if these levels are low, that could indicate poor upper GI absorption. Even the standard CBC, CMP, they can be very useful as well. Looking at the white blood cell count, high levels can indicate infections. Azonophils can be elevated if there's parasites present. Also looking at the uh, liver markers, looking to see if there's any liver inflammation going on. All these can be valuable clues on how proactive you need to be treating this. And like with anything, there's different supplements and herbs and nutrients that can help with healing, but the most important thing you can do is diet, lifestyle, stress reduction. These types of things are the key. You can't eat a poor diet, be massively stressed, and you know hope to heal your gut effectively. So that gives you an overall view of the intestinal health markers on the GI map test. Other tests that can be helpful if you've got gut issues is the Vibrant Wellness Gut Zuma, which is probably a more advanced test than the GI map. They also do the Wheat Zuma, Dairy Zuma, which gives you really detailed analysis of whether you're reacting to wheat, dairy, and, and also what part of the wheat or dairy you are reacting to. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you.